Hello and welcome back to the channel. You've joined us for probably what's going to be the hardest video we've done in a while. We're going to do the deep dive of the cranial nerve examination. So not only are we going to be doing the examinations we're going along, but also explaining all the bits. So I'm not sure how long this video is going to take. Hopefully it'll have a playlist a lot shorter than 45 minutes, but we'll see. It's certainly going to take us a couple of hours this evening, so join us for this anyway. So to start off our cranial nerve examination, obviously we want to make sure we introduce ourselves to the patient and make sure that we've adequately gelled our hands. Hello, my name's Dr Gill. We've been asked to do a cranial nerve examination of yourself today. Before we go any further, could we please confirm your name and date of birth? Yeah, Megan Strollers, um, 22nd of February 1998. Thank you. So today this is going to involve us having a look at the nerves that control your face and your head and neck. So we're going to be having a look at your eyes, getting you to do some movements, It'll also involve me touching your face, neck and shoulders. Is that okay? Yeah. Super. So to start off, we're going to have a look at your sense of smell. Have you noticed any issues with your sense of smell at all? No. Good. So can I confirm that you haven't had any added uh, smells, things that other people can't smell? No. Good. And um, you haven't noticed that people can smell things that you can't? No. Super. So it's important we, we get the baseline with regard to someone's uh, sense of smell before we go any further, because well, we need to know what it is we're dealing with or not, as we might be. So we'll have two um, chemicals sent, to be honest, whatever you can find knocking around that we can test the sense of smell with. So if I just give you the, um, these items, you might not be able to sense them, because we need to check something else first. Is your nostrils patent? So if you could put a finger over one side and breathe in. Super. And on the other side, please. OK. So maybe we're going to see a slight difference on one side, but we certainly got a patent nostril on the other. That's really important because the commonest cause of anosmia, lack of sense of smell, is actually a blocked nose. So we don't want to end up in the wrong situation there. The other reason we have two different things to smell is that, obviously, the nasal passages connect. So we, when um, we get someone to smell a scent, that's going to sit and percolate up there. If we ask them to smell the same thing on the opposite nostril, we don't know if they're smelling what is already up there or what they've actually smelled in again. So if you close your eyes for me and put a finger over one nostril and say when you can smell something. Mm -hmm. Okay, what could you smell there? Sweet sauce. Absolutely. And if you close your eyes, and the other nostril. And what can you smell there? Coffee. Excellent. So, we have no obvious issues with your sense of smell. Now, sense of smell, it seems such a small thing to test for, but can be really important in the A&E department. We can have things called contra-coup injuries, where somebody may have had a, 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 a severe road traffic accident, and their head has been pushed forward and then snapped backwards. That can actually push the brain along the base of the skull and rip off the nerves that go through what's called the cribiform plate, severing the sense of smell. So if someone's come into the A&E department and they seem to have sort of water coming out of their nose, is that cerebral spinal fluid that's, that's seeping out from where the cribiform plate has been damaged? Have they lost their sense of smell because actually they've got quite a significant brain injury inside? We need to test these things to make sure, and we'll find that throughout the cranial nerve examination. There are lots of what seem to be very minor tests that we're going to do to make sure actually everything else is working well. So after having tested the sense of smell, we need to go on to the second cranial nerve, uh, the optic nerve. So here we're just seeing how is your sense of vision. So again, checking baselines. Do you have any problems with your vision as far as you're aware? No. Okay. Do you wear glasses ordinarily or contact lenses? No. Super. So, real baseline, uh, if you have a look at my face, can you see any black splodges, anything missing, anything like that? Yeah. Super. So, what we then need to do is formally test your vision. So, I've got a Snellen chart behind me. It's very important, different Snellen charts will be designed for different um, distances from the patient. So, the one that we're using today should be used from six metres away. You can get little handheld ones, even. But one that we're using at distance is normally better because we can have it backlit to ensure we're getting the best resolution possible for the patient. So if you could put over a hand over one eye, please, and read from the bottom uh, line. L-E-F-O-D-P-C. 
C2. Super, that's all correct. If you could swap eyes and do the same again, but this side reading from the opposite side across. T, C, P, D, O, F, E, L. Thank you. So we've got... Uh, uh, we, uh, We've been able to read the, the lowest line on the Snellman chart there. And rather than reading the same thing twice, you know, modern opticians and things like that, they'll have two different Snellman charts they can control with a button. Unfortunately, we don't have that facility here. If you do find yourself using a physical chart, then by having them read the, from the left to right and then right to left, it makes it less likely that the patient is just memorising and repeating what they've just done. In terms of what we're looking at on the Snellen chart, we should be looking for someone to have vision 6 over 6. They can see at 6 metres what a normal person can see at 6 metres. In the UK, the limit for driving is 6 over 12. But the patient can see at 6 metres what a normal person can see at 12, which seems slightly astonishing to myself. But that's what the legal limit is here. Having um, completed the straightforward um, uh, visual acuity, we then need to have a look at the eye itself. So we're going to start off with uh, checking the red reflex. So we'll dim the lights. And from distance, I'm taking off my glasses and I'm going to have a look. So if you could look, uh, again look at the Snellen chart for me. And even though it's at some distance, I can see a red reflex in one, light, one eye and the other. So with the lights down, if you're looking straight ahead. And that's an excellent contraction there. And on the opposite side. So we're going to keep the, um, the lights down for this next bit. And then I'm going to have a look in your eyes. So again, I take my glasses off. And I make sure that I've set the, um, the diopters to the same uh, level that my um, uh, prescription is. If you don't know what that is, you can focus down on your uh, finger before you start. It's important that you look in the patient's opposite eye. So I'm using my, I would use my right eye to look in the patient's left eye. Ordinarily, I haven't done that because I have a problem with my right eye, but for the demonstration purposes, we will. So you put your hand on the patient's head and you're going in forwards and you're looking around the retina and once you've found the retina follow the, um, the blood vessels in and you can see over the, um, uh, the macula at the back of the eye so you're looking at the optic disc make sure you look all the way around so you're looking for the clarity of the disc where there's any blurring of the edges and then trace around the, um, uh, the veins making sure you can see that there's no copper wiring, AV nipping, or any signs of um, damage to the retina itself. And if you can look directly into the light for me. Okay, and oh, no, that's fine, thank you. So there's no issues on the one side, and then we need to do the same on the other. So I'm gonna move around. So ordinarily, you'd swap eyes, as I say, putting one hand on the patient's forehead so you don't bang into them. And again, finding those vessels, having a look at the back of the eye, again looking at the disc, checking the edges and then following around all the way around the edge of the retina, looking for any signs of AV nipping, any copper wiring or any um, cotton wool lesions. And if you look directly into the light again, Thank you. So we've got no obvious issues there. And it always works well if you can give the patient a moment to blink off the light as you put the light back on. Okay. So whilst we've covered the fundoscopy, we've had a look at the back of the eye where everything seems to be um, healthy. We then need to see how the eye is reacting. So although I've obviously seen her eyes um, changing as I've shone a light in it, I've been paying attention to something different at that point. So again, we're going to check the response to a light shining in the eye, but I'm looking for both the constriction of the pupil I'm shining the light in, but also the response to the opposite pupil. So I'm looking for a consensual response as well. So again, if you look straight ahead for me, 
and we're coming in from the side and then in and we've got a nice response and again checking the other side again we've got excellent constriction we can also have something called a relative afferent pupillary defect so in terms of a pupillary response uh, the signal goes in on the optic nerve but the signal to contract comes back down cranial nerve 3 so if we've got something that's affecting the inflow I, um, so on cranial nerve 2, for example, uh, multiple sclerosis, when we shine the light in the eye and quickly move to the opposite side, the eye that is affected will uh, paradoxically dilate when the darkness uh, is, is removed. We're shining the light there, constricts, and there, constricts. And now we're seeing if the pupil dilates, which it doesn't, when we shine the light on it. So we know that there is apparently a clear afferent and efferent pathways. So cranial nerve 2 and cranial nerve 3 appear intact. But we do have other things that we need to test on cranial nerve 3, which we'll be doing shortly. Okay. So now we need to assess, um, staying with cranial nerve 2, we're looking at the visual fields. So for this we need to make sure we're approximately an arm's length away from the patient. We get the patient to put a hand over their left eye. Now I always let the patient do that first because I get my lefts and rights mixed up, so I will then copy the opposite side. If the patient wears glasses, we also, uh, they can keep their glasses on for this. So have the patient look into your eye and keep looking here. Tell me when you see my finger waggling. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And as I'm doing this, I'm comparing when I can see uh, my finger with when the patient can see my finger. And I'm trying to keep my arm equidistant from the patient at all times as I'm doing that. So we're testing the very edges of the visual fields as much as anything. So if you could swap hands to the other side. And again, staying only looking in this eye. Yeah. 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 Perfect. So we can complicate things slightly more by using a hat pin. Now the hat pin has many uses in a neurological examination, particularly the red part. The reason being is the colour can be very specific to testing um, different parts of the cranial nerves. So we've just assessed the visual fields just using the distraction technique. There are some people who object to that, saying the patient is actually noticing the movement of the finger as opposed to being able to notice the finger in its own right. In which case, the, we can do the same again with the red hat pin. So again, making sure that we're equidistant from the patient. If you could put a hand over one eye for me. So I'm doing the same on the opposite, holding the hat pin in my hand and going again out to the same part that I did previously. But now I want you to tell me when you can see the hat pin becoming red rather than just see the hat pin? No. Okay. No. And, no, I said it. No. No. So again, I would agree with that, but it's a much harder test because of how you've got to pay attention to a small change as you're going uh, from the outside of your vision to the inside where you've got the concentration of the cones for the colour vision. Staying with the hat pin, we're then going to try and find the patient's um, uh, blind spot. It tends to take a little bit of well, messing around to find the point, but we're going to again make sure our arms distance away from the patient. If you put a hand over one eye for me, I'm going to do the same, covering one eye, and I know that my blind spot should be about here. So I'm going to move the pin, tell me when the hat pin disappears at the top. So it's disappeared for me here. So there we go, I can't see it now. There. There we go, right. So I can't see the top of the hat pin and you can't either. Okay, so tell me when the hat pin reappears. Yeah. Yeah. Gone. And it's back yeah. for me. Okay, it's back for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, going disappeared, so I'm going up, reappeared, mm -hmm. and down. I can see it again, can you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got a blind spot that maps for both of us, so I'm not concerned at an enlargement of the blind spot there, as we might get with optic neuritis, for example. We need to do the same again on the opposite side, so swap eyes. Again, just focusing only in my eye here, 
And there we go. The, the, the hat pins disappear from myself. Yeah, it's gone. Okay, tell me when it comes back. Mine's yeah. back. Okay, disappeared. Yeah. And back. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's gone. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can see it again. Yeah. And disappears. Yeah. And tell me when it reappears. Yeah. Perfect. So again, eye align as well. So we've got normal sized blind spots on both eyes there. Thank you. So when it comes to cranial nerve two, we've obviously used the red of the hat pin to uh, assess the most sensitive parts of the visual fields. But the red in itself is also important because optic neuritis will um, maybe very subtly detected if there is a red desaturation. So if you just look at the hat pin for a second and put a hand over one eye, and now swap uh, hands looking at the hat pin. Does it look the same level of red as saturated um, between one eye and the other? Yeah. Super. Now I highlight that to yourselves. Unfortunately, when I was a child, um, I had optic neuritis. So in my right eye, the hat pin looks much paler than it does do with my uh, left eye. Now I have no active issues with it, with it but that change in uh, color vision will never uh, return. And that brings us nicely onto the Ishihara charts. Uh, we can complete the uh, cranial nerve 2 examination by uh, checking the, uh, the um, control uh, cards to make sure that there are no issues with colour vision. So, can you um, tell me what is shown there, please? 12. Okay. And on these two? 8 and then 6. Okay. And the final two? 29 and 57. Okay. So we've got no issues with the start of those um, issue higher charts. As a result, we do not need to complete the test. However, if there have been any doubt with those uh, numbers, or if alternative ones have been identified, then we would have completed the rest of the Ishihara plates. So after having uh, confirmed that the visual fields are um, intact, and we've got no problems with an enlarged blind spot, we then need to look at the um, nerves Three four, five, uh, 3, 4, and 6, which are going to control the movements of the eye, as well as the actual uh, pupil itself. One of the things that we will need is we'll need a piece of paper as well to check for nystagmus. If I get the patient to look all the way to the left and all the way to the right, there might not be uh, any nystagmus because there's a focus to the surrounding environment. If, however, we put the paper to the side and then have them look all the way to the left and the right, the paper blocks the ability to focus on something. So we may then um, be able to establish the, uh, the presence of nystagmus that was sufficiently mild, we've missed it previously. So in terms of starting off to check those, uh, the movement of the eye, if you keep your head still and just follow my finger, okay, and tell me if you see any double vision. Any double vision? Mm -hmm. Any double vision? No. Okay. Any double vision? No. Any double vision? No. Any no. double vision? And any double vision? No. That's fine. Look at my finger, and all the way behind, and then back to my finger. That's fine. So, we're going to do the same again. I'm just going to place the piece of paper there. And if you could look all the way that way, please. So we've got two beats of nystagmus, but that's not a problem. You can have up to about six without any issues. Look all that way. And again, her eyes sitting there, keeping uh, the focus that direction without any abnormal beats. It, you can test for nystagmus yourself, or should I say you can demonstrate nystagmus yourself by spinning around uh, in a chair several times and then looking all the way one way and the other. That will generate nystagmus in one of your friends, so you can see what we're looking for there. If a patient uh, did have issues with uh, nystagmus, then we may be looking at a cerebellar issue, um, such as um, intoxication. Another uh, thing you may be able to test at home, drinking maybe too much beer, and seeing whether or not you develop any nystagmus at that point. One of the other things that you can do with the ophthalmoscope, or just generally looking at the patient, is assessing the eyelids, the areas around the eye. This is quite important, as there are conditions which from a cranial nerve perspective, which will affect the eyelid. For example, Horner syndrome, where we have a lesion to cranial nerve 3. That will result in ptosis, so the eyelid coming down partially. It will result in anhydrosis, so the lack of ability to sweat on one side of the face. 
Admittedly, that's not really something I can easily test, but it'll also cause meiosis, so a small pupil on the affected side. Here I can see all the way around the eyes and both pupils are looking equal and I can't see any other issues with that. So I can't see anything that would suggest there is a ptosis here. One of the other things that we can do from a slightly ophthalmological perspective is shining the light directly at the patient from a distance back and I'm looking at the point of light on each eye. So here it's central over the pupil on both sides, so I've got no concerns about a squint or astigmatism here. So having um, assessed uh, the movements of the eye, we're then going to specifically uh, move on to the fifth cranial nerve. So we've done three, four and six, but we now need to go back to look at the areas of sensation. And there are three main branches for cranial nerve five. So we've got the ophthalmic, maxillary and mandibular region. So we're going to test that with two um, uh, bits of equipment. We've got the cotton wool bud and we've also got the, um, uh, the, the, the neuro tip. So we're going to twizzle out a little bit of cotton wool and we're going to touch up and down on the patient's face, making sure very much that it's up and down and we're not stroking the patient because that's causing excess stimulation, uh, which may give them a, a false positive. So if you close your eyes for me and say yes if you feel me touch you. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we've uh, we, we've got no problems with soft touch, and as we saw that, I'm going uh, I'm checking different parts on the face when I'm moving across, so that the patient doesn't know that after having touched the right side of the forehead. I'm also going to touch the left side of the forehead. We're then going to move over to a neuro tip where uh, we're testing for um, superficial pain. So again, very carefully up and down. We're not, you know, trying to. We're not pushing too hard because we don't want to cause any damage to the patient. So, if you close your eyes for me. Yeah. Yeah. Super. So again, we've got no problems with sensation there. Another part of sensation that we need to check, and this is going to connect with uh, our previous cranial nerves as well, is looking for the corneal reflex. So the corneal reflex is essentially a protective reflex. If something touches the eye, it causes the patient to blink. Some people will lose the corneal reflex if, for example, they've been used to wearing contact lenses, so that reflex has become blunted. Now, if I go straight at the patient, then they're going to blink anyway. So we need to find a way around that. So we get a new piece of uh, cotton wool, and we'll twizzle that again. And we're now going to check for the corneal reflex. So if you could look upwards for me. Okay. And we're going to just use the cotton wool bud coming in from the side. There we go, so we've got a good blink. And if we could look the opposite way, and coming in from the side, and just touching that interface, there we go, uh, between the sclera and the cornea. We've got a good blink reflex, and then we make sure that we bin that piece of cotton wool so it's, uh, we don't use it uh, again. So when we're, using, when we're checking for the cornea reflex, it's very important we're using an, a fresh piece of cotton wool, one that we haven't used for the soft touch of the face, so there's no possibility of cross-infection. And then once that's done, we're similarly going to bin that cotton wool as well. Having checked for uh, the sensation on uh, the uh, trigeminal nerve, we also need to check for uh, the motor components. So that's specifically the muscles of mastication. So we're going to check for uh, the um, temporalis, the masseter, and the uh, pterygoids. So we're going to do that by comparing either side. If you can bite down for me and relax, and then bite again and relax. Now the pterygoids are inside the jaw, so I'm not going to be able to press on those. So instead what we're going to get the patient to do is open your mouth and wiggle your jaw side to side. So again, we've got equal movement on both sides, so we know that there is no issue there. When we did sensation for uh, the trigeminal nerve, we can get issues with trigeminal neuralgia, where we get intense pain, often when we've got um, a, a viral infection to uh, the trigeminal nerve. If we have uh, a lack of sensation over, the, uh, over one area, it's important that we, tap, that we uh, identify how big that loss of sensation is. 
because it's possible that it may not be the trigeminal nerve that's affected. The very angle of the jaw is actually innervated by the roots from C2 rather than the trigeminal nerve itself. So there are going to be a few areas of overlap with other sources of innervation. So to complete our examination of uh, the trigeminal nerve, we also need to check uh, for the reflexes. So um, what we're going to do, I'm going to put, put my fingers on your chin and I'm going to ask you to just try and relax your jaw as best you can. And I'm going to strike it and see what happens. So just relax for me. So unsurprisingly, we don't have any medical problems here, thus we have a, a normal or almost absent reflex. Um, the jaw jerk's a bit of a vague test that for the vast majority of people, we don't get a positive response, but that's a good thing. We worry if we've got a, um, a, an upper motor neuron lesion, whereupon we're going to get a very brisk reflex and the patient's jaw will tap shut uh, when we do that reflex. So the facial nerve is a very important nerve for assessments because it can give us a, a, a strong indication of what, what's going on inside the skull. If we have a Bell's palsy, so this is a lower motor neuron lesion, often a virus affecting uh, the facial nerve, then we're going to um, have um, drooping of the side, the side of the face that's affected. We are, however, are going to lose the ability to raise the eyebrow, we're going to lose the ability to close the, um, uh, the eyelid uh, effectively, and also they're going to be unable to make a good seal at the mouth, so blow their cheeks out. Now, the reason why I highlight that is because there's something called forehead sparing that can occur. If we've got the lower motor neuron lesion, so Bell's palsy, we're talking about that lesion affecting the nerve after the nerve has left the skull. Conversely, if we have an upper motor neuron lesion, because of the fact that the nerve crosses over before it leaves the skull, we can have bilateral innervation to the forehead only. So what that means is that there is a supply from the right side of the brain going to the right side and also to the left side of the face. So if you have a stroke before um, uh, the uh, facial nerve has left the, uh, the skull, then unlike the patient with Bell's palsy, you'll have forehead sparing because the opposite side of the brain will be able to compensate. So the big differentiator between a Bell's palsy and a stroke is the fact that with a stroke, they'll be able to raise both eyebrows. And unfortunately, I've seen that in real life. We had a patient that had some medical knowledge and she thought that she'd had a Bell's palsy because she'd got drooping of the face, she'd got slight slurring of words, and she could move her eyebrows. Unfortunately, she delayed coming to the hospital because she thought that she'd simply had an issue with a virus perhaps, and she could delay coming in to get some uh, steroids. Unfortunately, because she had the forehead sparing, she could move both of her eyebrows, we knew straight away that this lady had had a stroke. And unfortunately, she delayed in attending because she got the wrong information in her head. So essentially, that doubles down on the straightforward, fast, positive features. If someone's got facial weakness and slurring of speech, then come and see us straight away. We want to make sure this isn't something much more serious than a simple viral infection. I say a simple infection. Bell's palsy can be cause significant problems for a patient, but nowhere near as serious as an upper motor neuron lesion or a stroke. So with uh, cranial nerves one, two, three, four, five, and six covered, we then need to go on to the, the facial nerve. So this is uh, looking at the expression of the face mainly. So a relatively straightforward test. So we basically go to pull some faces. So if you could raise your eyebrows up as high as you can. Okay. Uh, this is an important test and we can see we've got wrinkling over both um, um, eyebrows as we would hope to see. If you could screw your eyes tight as you can. And I'm going to put my fingers on your face. Don't let me open them. That's fine. And can you show me your teeth, please? That's fine. And can you try and whistle, please, or blow? Okay, so you've successfully pursed your lips. That's fine. So, and the final thing, if you can blow your cheeks out, Okay, and good. So you've managed to maintain the seal, so we've got no obvious issues uh, with uh, the facial nerve in terms of muscle control. 
And to finish off uh, the facial nerve, it's always worthwhile asking about the sensation of taste. So the, um, uh, the, the facial nerve supplies the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Um, we don't formally test it, but if the patient notices anything changing in their, their palate, it can be uh, a sign there might be something going on. Have you noticed any changes in your sense of taste? No. Okay, thank you. Having completed our facial nerve examination, we then need to look at the ears. So we're going to get our tuning fork. Ideally, we should be using a 512 hertz tuning fork, but we can get away with using a 256 for this particular part of the examination. So first off, we need to assess if the patient has any problems with their hearing. So um, how are your ears, to the best of your knowledge? Yeah, they're working fine. Okay, so what we're going to do before we get the tuning fork out, I need to confirm that your hearing is okay. So if you could rub over um, one finger um, by an ear, please, and I'm going to whisper something, and I'd like you to tell me what number I'm saying. 55. 55. Okay, and if you could again rub the front of your ear, so we're getting a distraction sound here. 67. 67. So we're sat uh, an easily three feet apart. Um, uh, the patient's been able to identify both uh, numbers that I've said with a distraction. So I'm objectively and subjectively happy that the patient doesn't have any clear issues with their hearing. But then we're going to take our tuning fork and assess that with a little bit more detail. So we're going to look at your hearing in a different way now. I'm going to get this tuning fork, I'm going to strike it, and we'll place it in the centre of your forehead. When we do that, you'll hear a noise in your head, and I need to know if the noise sounds central, to the left or the right. Central. Perfect. So that's exactly where we need it. So uh, a central uh, Weber sign suggests it's unlikely that there's anything untoward going on, and thus we don't need to go on to do any further testing. However, it's always wise to complete your examination because there's always a maybe. So we're going to do um, a, a further assessment by putting it behind your ear, if that's okay. So if you could move your hair towards the back, please. So I'm going to strike the fork. So you can hear the noise there. Okay, tell me when you can't. No. Okay, and I'm moving the tuning fork around, putting it directly towards the ear. Can you hear it again? Yeah. Super. So we've got a normal examination on that side. Air conduction is better than bone conduction. We're going to do the same again, just moving the hair back. And if you can hear the noise, tell me when you can't. No. Okay, can you hear the noise now? Yeah. Super. So we've got intact air conduction and bone conduction on both sides along with a normal Weber's test, so we know that there's no problems with the hearing here. So in terms, in terms of that, we need to think about how we're designed as creatures, as it were. Our air conduction with regard to hearing should always be better than bone conduction because, well, look at the flappy things on the side of our head. Our ears are designed to funnel sound from the air into our heads so we can hear it. So it makes sense that our air conduction is better than our bone conduction. Now, if we combine that with our uh, Weber's test, if we th think that someone has a blocked ear, full of wax or an infection perhaps, then Weber's will move towards that side. The reason being is that that ear is blocked. So their bone conduction is going to be much better than their air conduction because essentially that earwax is stopping the air conduction going through. Conversely, if there is no blockage to the ear, but Weber's test is still going off to one side, that is going to indicate, again with air conduction being better than bone conduction on both sides, that we're looking at a sensory neural hearing loss. The way I've always thought about that is that because the nerve on what, uh, the opposite side to where the uh, tuning fork sound has gone to isn't working very well, the body has turned up the sensitivity in the opposite ear, thus dragging the sound across inside the skull. That's kind of what's going on, not completely correct biologically, but I think it works for understanding it very well. We can have issues with combined sensory neural hearing loss and a conductive hearing loss, but that adds an extra level of complexity, um, which we'll leave for the table, we'll show you in a minute or two. So as we can see here on uh, the table, we've got our Weber's um, on the top and our Rini's tests on the side. As we've just discussed, we've got our um, uh, Weber's uh, centrally, air conduction being better than bone conduction 
on both sides, and thus we know that things are fine. There's no problems. However, we can have a, uh, a Rinne's test that is abnormal, in, uh, even though our Weber's is central, and that's why we've got this conductive hearing loss, which is why we've balanced the position of the Weber's sound inside the head. But uh, this table really is the thing that you need to keep in mind when it comes to doing these additional tests with regard to hearing. So um, with regard to uh, what we've shown here with the table, um, we do have another video looking specifically at the Weber's and Rinne's test, which hopefully, if I've got my left and right correct, you should be able to see on the link up here. So we've uh, covered um, the cranial nerve 8, now we need to move on, unsurprisingly, to cranial nerve 9. We're going to do the glossopharyngeal. There's actually relatively little for us to test here. The main thing is internal, so we're looking at the uvula. So we'll again take our um, ophthalmoscope, but we're using more as a pen torch. And if we get the patient open wide as they can, okay, say ah, ah, and we can see the uvula moving up directly uh, with the, the phonation sound that they're making. Now, uh, we, the uvula will indicate the presence of an upper motor neuron lesion by moving away from the side. So if we think that the uvula is central, because both sides are pulling equally. So when the patient phonates, they say, ah, oh, both sides move up together. The side that isn't working um, when they phonate will mean that it, the, the uvula is pulled one way. So it'll be pulled towards the direction of the side which is unaffected. That's going to be very important when we have a look at cranial nerve 12. So keep that bit in mind for the moment. Having uh, completed cranial nerve 9, we then need to look at cranial nerve 10, the vagus. There's relatively little for us to do here. Sometimes if a patient has had issues with their blood pressure, we may find that uh, we can detect uh, a problem from the vagus nerve. Vagus comes from the Latin for wanderer, um, which is why it affects so many different parts of the body. Um, in the intestines, the stomach, the breathing. Um, it, the vagus nerve is as I say, more something that we're aware of um, when it's gone wrong rather than having a positive test. The only other thing that we can really test here is get the patient to cough. So if you cough, please. <coughs> and we've got good control there. We've got a good, normal, strong, strong cough. We don't have a bovine cough, sort of a long cough that doesn't seem to end. Okay. Um, our final two cranial nerves, cranial nerve 11, the accessory nerve, so this is looking at the muscles of the head and neck. So we're going to start off with the shoulders. So if you just shrug your shoulders up for me. Okay. Any problems with that? No. Nope. Super. I'm now going to put my hands on your shoulders and I want you to shrug your shoulders against me. Okay. Any issues with that? Nope. Good. So we've got excellent power. As well as testing that, we also need to look at the sternocleidomastoid muscles for movement of the head. So I'm going to put my hand by the side of your head and I want you to turn your head into my hand. So push, 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 push. Any problems with that? No. Nope. Super. And we'll do the same on the opposite side. Push, 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 push. Perfect. So um, she's not been able to move my hands away. Uh, we've got good strength of the muscles there. Now, with regard to cranial nerve 11, we're looking for an ipsilateral problem. Our final cranial nerve, cranial nerve 12, as we mentioned a few moments ago, does connect in terms of how we're assessing with regard to when we looked at the glossopharyngeal nerve. So the glossopharyngeal nerve identifies the opposite side where the lesion is. We've got the inverse here. With cranial nerve 12, we're finding that the tongue never lies. So if you could stick your tongue out for me, please. Okay, thank you. And the tongue has come out straight. If there is a, a, a lesion affecting the tongue, then the tongue will deviate towards the side where the lesion is. Because in order to um, protract the tongue, um, we need to have the muscles coming out equally on both sides. If there's a weakness there, then the normal side will overpower the weak side of the tongue, causing a deviation away. We want to finally confirm that strength of the tongue by getting the patient to push into the side of their cheek. And if you could push in, okay, and the opposite side. And again, so we know that strength is intact. That's completed our cranial nerve examination, so we thank the patient. And any questions for yourself on that? No. Super. Well, thank you for your time today. Thank you. So, as I said, the cranial nerve exam, there's an awful lot to go on with here. What we've focused on more here today is how you're doing the examination as opposed to the whys. If you want, we've got a whole playlist 
on uh, the, deep, uh, the, the deep understanding of the cranial nerve examinations. Please have a look at those to look at pathology and different things that you can see when they've gone wrong. And if you want, uh, if there's any further bits we can do to help with understanding what we're doing during the examination, put them in the comments down below and we'll see if we can help you from there. So thank you very much for watching this far. I hope it's been useful and uh, we'll see you in the next one, which will hopefully be a bit shorter. Take care.